But now I want to bring in my guests for this hour. I want to welcome uh, forensic criminologist Laura Petler is with us and family law attorney Randy Kessler as well. Uh, hello to you both. Thank you so much for being on the show. And Laura, I'll start with you. Um, I want to start with Dean. Big day. He decides to take the stand, first witness in the defense's case. Um, I thought he held up pretty well on direct, cross a little bit of a different story, but I'd love to get your thoughts on how he did on the stand today. You know, I watched part of that trial today, Michael, earlier as it was playing live, and I thought it was very interesting the way that he spoke on direct and on cross. And for me, like I was watching his eyes go back and forth. I was watching who he was paying attention to. I was looking for a lot of the body language that we see from different witnesses who take the stand. And was he making eye contact with people? And I think that he was telling his story. And when he felt confronted, he responded in a stern way. And I just used that word just specifically to describe that he had a different tone toward the prosecutors than he did necessarily to the, his defense team. Yeah, you know, you make an interesting point. I want to touch on that in a minute. But first, I want to get Randy's reaction to his testimony today. I think one thing was clear. Um, well, I don't want to say clear, but it seemed to me that this was something that Aaron Dean wanted to do. Um, I'm not sure he needed to do it. I thought, you know, the general consensus was the state's case was a little weak. Um, he takes the stand, opens the door to a rebuttal case that's going to include, I would imagine, a lot of training type witnesses coming in. But your thoughts on how he did on the stand? Well, I think that's a very important point, Michael, right? To testify or not is the first question. You know, are you better off having testified or not? You know, I can't help but think if I was on a jury and somebody didn't testify, even though I know they have the right not to, what are they hiding? Why won't they just come out and say, I didn't do it? He's avoided that question already. So I think he's ahead of the game just by volunteering to testify when he doesn't have to. And everyone in America knows you don't have, the, you don't have to testify and you can't, it can't be used against you. So that having been said, I think he held up pretty well. I think that, of course, they're going to make some points. If they don't score any points on cross-examination, then why in the heck are they prosecuting, right? If they don't have some good uh, questions, then most prosecutors are, are dying to get after a defendant on the witness stand because they so rarely get to do it. I don't think the prosecution had a great bunch of stuff to throw at him uh, as they would in other cases where the people probably are right not to testify. He had to be human. He had to take this out of I'm the mean, bad police officer that should know better into I'm a human being that was doing my job. And, and I'm sorry, and I think some remorse came through. I think some regret came through, and I think he was human. You could see it uh, in his eyes and in his voice. Yeah, I, I'd have to agree in part. I think what came across most for me, Dr. Petler, was this idea that he was a police officer. He was in that situation, and sometimes mistakes are made, but at the end of the day, he felt like he was in fear for his life, which is the key question in this case. But what I want to touch on, it goes back to what you were talking about, about his responses to the state's questions. I thought he was stern, but I also thought at times he got very sheepish, and he almost was agreeing with a lot of what the state was saying in terms of bad policing, which seemed to be a theme that they had. They wanted to continually get him to agree that there was bad policing going on. But I thought he didn't have to agree as much. There was one instance where they asked him, you shot not knowing what was behind the woman? Isn't that bad policing? And he said, yes. And I thought to myself, I said, well, if I see a barrel of a gun pointed at me, I'm not going to wait to figure out what's behind somebody. So maybe it really wasn't bad policing, but they kind of had him on that train. Your thoughts? You know, going back to um, the perception, you know, what is his perception versus somebody else's perception? You know, Michael, the three of us could be out there in his very situation, and we might perceive the situation three completely different ways. Just like when 10 people see the same car accident, you know, they all might have a different perception of it. So the human brain processes information at a certain speed. And yes, while it's fast, they, police officers oftentimes do feel like they are in a life or death situation. And he even said that in part of his testimony to the, to the effect of, you know, I didn't realize how close we were to dying or something. I don't know what it was verbatim, but I think that uh, it, he's demonstrating his perception of the situation and, and no, not thinking about what's behind him. He's thinking about his, saving his own life. Absolutely, I would have to agree because at the end of the day, what the defense wants to do is put those jurors in his shoes because that's the big question. What did he perceive and was it reasonable for him to react that way? Uh, quickly, Randy, I want to turn to Hawk. Um, that's our case where the, the child died. Um, 
At the end of the day, that's a question for me, or that case is about causation. Um, the state in their opening statement talked about the arrogance of uh, the defendant and how she made these people believe certain things, which put them in a situation to make certain choices, which then led to the death of this child. But I think that's the tough part of their case, is showing that the actions and the things that this defendant did, Angela Hawk, led to the death of this child. Right. It's a lot more like a civil case, and maybe that's why they went without a jury trying to prove that what she did caused the death. And I also think it's interesting, of course, that they went without a jury, but maybe that's exactly why. You know, we always say you don't need motive, you don't need that other stuff, you just need to prove that the person did it and intended to do it. You know, this is a much more nuanced case. And um, in this case, proving that she did this, and, you know, they used her the first time, they used her the second time. She didn't get into this business to try to kill children. That's clear from everybody. She had to have some goodness in her heart. Uh, it's going to be a tough case to prove, I think, and it's definitely not one that, you know, you can say, oh, this was malice with intent, of, you know, forethought, and she went in there trying to cause the death of this child. I mean, it, it, you got to look at the letter of the law, and, and you hate to be a prosecutor and have to win on technicalities and have to be arguing the law. You'd rather just walk in and say, look at this horrible person, what they did, just convict them because they did this bad thing. This is not that case. This is a tough one. Yeah, it is a tough one, and I think it was the right choice to put it in front of the judge. All right, Randy, Dr. Laura, stand by. I do have to take a break. What I want to know from you folks is what you thought of the Aaron Dean uh, testimony and his time on the stand. Head to our Court TV social media pages. Leave your comment. We're going to read some of them, of course, a little later in our show. But first, the family of murdered teen Heyman Lee is asking for a redo for that hearing after Adnan Syed's murder conviction was vacated. I instructed my office to dismiss the criminal case against Adnan Saeed following the completion of a second round of touch DNA testing of items that were never tested before. Justice is done. Tonight on Closing Arguments, a preview of a two-night court TV special event. It was the biggest trial of the year. Now, Chanley Painter sits down for an exclusive interview with Johnny Depp's legal team.